Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? All right, folks, I just need to check that my What I should have done was check that my references were set to the right microphone. So if you guys just bear with me, it looks like everything is okay. All right. So uh, you guys should be able to should be able to chat with me. I can see that some of you have said yes. Uh, Chris Lucas said the sounds a bit muted, but Deborah Brandt says hello, and you're coming through loud and clear. So uh, um, I wonder if that's something to do with your your sound, Chris Lucas. Um, I'm just going to shout out a few names of people I recognise. Please feel free to type back and say hello. Sorted in settings, well done. Okay, let's see who we've got then that I recognize. Bethany Smith, hello, Bethany Smith. Hello, Chris Jenkins. Hello, Chris Willerton, Deborah Brandt, Ian Dixon, Innis Mackay, James Locke, Jason Ennis, Jason Jobes, lots of Jasons on the show. Joe Mitchinson, Laura Clark, Louise Sinclair, Lucinda Booth, Lucy Stephen, Mary Arnold, Mark Finn, Paul Thompson, Rosie Helps, Sue, Sarah, China with Simon Norris, Stacey Atkins, Steve L, and Steve Lewis, Tracy Smedley. Good evening, everybody. Um, sorry if I didn't call your name out. I just quickly picked up some random people there so that you knew I knew, so that you knew that I knew you were on the show. Um, now we we had a we had over 130 people registered for tonight, and it's not yet 7 p.m. So I will give everybody a chance to join the show. And there were some people who said they might be late as well. <clears throat> so um, I did ask for questions. I sent you all an email this morning. You may not have seen that. It wasn't, this wasn't quite this morning. Um, you may not have seen that. But if you have any questions, please just type them in the chat panel. And I will get to them at the end, if that's OK. Um, I'll have to go back through them. Um, I would like to introduce you to Beth. Beth, uh, I mentioned Beth on the uh, at the beginning there as one of the participants tonight. Beth is my assistant. For those of you who have um, entered the Outlaw and already have one of my programs that you uh, were able to purchase at sign up, um, you will have received a welcome message from myself and Beth. So Beth takes on takes care of all the onboarding. Uh, cost she's like the customer delight manager, if you like. And she makes sure that uh, everybody's happy with what they've got and they've got the right programs. So um, for those of you who don't have programs yet, I will be going through how to purchase a, an official Outlaw Triathlon training plan at the end of the show. And um, Beth is the person you'll be dealing with in order to get that processed as smoothly as possible. Okay, so um, let's see if we've got. Okay, yeah, Beth's written a, um, a message there. So actually, um, if you had a specific um, message for Beth, you could just put in brackets for Beth, um, and then she'll be able to see those come up on the chat as well. All right, so I am going to share my screen with you now. So. Uh, for those of you who can see me, you're not going to be able to see me going forwards until uh, until the time I jump in. You're going to be able to see my slides, um, and I might not see what you're asking me. So I'll I'll pause in between each bit and and jump off the slides and come back to the come back to this uh, video thing here. Um, so let's get rolling. Okay, actually, I need to jump out of that first and get on to, go 
onto this. I knew that I should have worked out how to use this properly. It's been a while since I've done a webinar. Okay, with Zoom. So let's go on to this. Okay, dokes. Right. Here we are then. So Outlaw Triathlon. Now that says Outlaw Triathlon, uh, Outlaw Full Triathlon. But of course, I know that some of you guys have um, entered for Outlaw Half um, and the other Outlaw Half distance events. So that could be Holcomb, that could be X, or that could be the one that's in the south of England uh, that I can't quite remember at the moment, but I am supposed to be there. So. Um, if you hadn't already worked out or, or understood the distances, that is a 2.4 mile swim, not meters, 112 miles on the bike and 26.2 miles on the run. That's an outlaw distance. There are other events, MDOT events that have also used that distance. But, but for us in the outlaw family, we see those as outlaw distance events that, that are that happen around the world this is the outlaw distance and then of course there's the half outlaw distance which is 1.2 miles 56 miles and 13.1 and that's a picture of rachel hawker there i think she was winning um in holcomb and that's the that's the view of your picture with the beautiful hall behind uh, i don't think there's been a time when we've done that race when the sun hasn't been shining so the finishing photos are really good um and that's what it looks like. Uh, unfortunately, the finish lines might look a little different in future due to the COVID restrictions. But hey, uh, I think next year we'll all be glad just to be racing, won't we? And we'll, as your commentary, as your coach and your commentary team, we'll, we're really looking forward to, to seeing you at the start line. So anyway, by the time you get to this point, you will hear me or Kyle or Lee or John Levison or Louise or a combination of us shouting, you are an outlaw. And that's what we're all aiming for. Okay, now, I think I might have mentioned in my original email to you that there would be future webinars, and that's important because it, it, it sort of frames what I'm going to talk about today and what I'm not going to talk about. So I'm not, um, you can ask me questions if you like, uh, but I don't intend really to spend a great deal of time on it um, because right at the moment, it's not really that relevant. So things like how do I, how do I taper? What food should I eat on the bike on race day? You know, what time do I need to rack? Those are all things that we can consider and talk about in future pod, uh, podcasts, in future webinars. So today I want to talk about what we, what you really need to be thinking about right now in the middle of November about the next few months of training to create your foundation to move on to what we'll talk about in January, which is the specific conditioning, which makes it a little bit more race specific. And then um, that won't start. So for some of you that wouldn't start in March, but I want to make sure that we get these webinars done. So everybody gets chance to listen to them. Even those who are racing um, outlaw half in middle of May and Holcomb in early uh, Holcomb in um, early July. Okay. So, We'll, we'll talk about specific conditioning in January. We'll talk about how you move that into very race specific training in March. And then we'll, in, in May, we'll do the fourth webinar and we'll talk about peaking, tapering and race day stuff. And what we might do is do a, a special webinar for those people who are racing at Outlaw Full. All right. But, and now I did want, I, I, I did think about um, changing that slide and saying before you, put the icing on the cake and eat the cake. You have to make the cake. That's something that I've, uh, a, a phrase that I've used and Stephen Seiler has used a bit when I've, when I've chatted with him on my podcast, but Hey, this, this one is fine. Before you get to the summit, you have to climb the mountain. And so that's what we're going to start at today. Think of yourself at the foot of the mountain and that stuff that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, you know what, what you do on race day, that's a bit like, uh, thinking about the last few steps before you plant the flag on the summit. So let's let's not worry ourselves too much about that right now because there's a lot of stuff to get done before. So there are four key points I'd like to make at this point. You need to have a plan, right? Now, I, I write plans. That's my job as a triathlon coach. I write plans to help people train 
for races. And in the last 10 years, I've helped, I've never counted up, but let's say 50, 60 people purchase a program each year over 10 years. That's, that's well over, probably well over 500 people that have um, bought and trained and successfully used the plan to get to the finish line of an outlaw event. I've been doing this for 25 years. So the number of people who've used my training programs to help them get to the end of outlaw distance races all over the world um, or to qualify for age groups or Great Britain or whatever is probably over a thousand now. And so I know that my programs work as long as you stick to the plan. Now that's not to say my programs are massively different or massively better than those of other coaches. I just know that the ones that I do work. Um, but you do need to have a plan of some sort and you need to stick to it. And one of the common issues that I find with a lot of athletes is that they, they get a few weeks in and then they think, oh, it's not working, so I'll change it. So they, they, they zag and then they get a few weeks into that program and think, oh, it's not working, I'll go back to the next one. So they zig and they end up zigging and zagging and they never make as much progress as the people who stick to a plan. Okay, And the best, the best time to assess whether a plan's worked is where, when you've done the race and that's when you start tweaking it. So make sure you have a plan, make sure you stick to it. And if you have a fail to have a plan, then um, as the saying goes, you're planning to fail really. Time management is really important. You need to find time to train. And I find that triathletes have no difficulty whatsoever with finding time to train in general. Some people have a little bit more time than others, but most people don't don't struggle with time to train but they are not as good at finding the time to recover and again i can tell you that the athletes who do best aren't aren't the ones who train hardest they're the ones who train hardest and recover hardest so they've got both bases covered right you need to commit you need to commit to the, this if if you've got a goal of getting to the end of the race or to set a pb or even to get on the podium in your age group it's, you don't really want to be half in. It's a bit like being pregnant. You either you are or you're not. Okay. So all in or all out, please don't go into this half cocked because there must've been something that caused you to enter in the first place. And what, what, what we as volunteers find terribly sad is when we see people who just, they've not really done the training. And so perhaps they don't make the swim cut off or they don't make the bike cut off. Cause it's, it's really very emotional, both for the volunteers who have to tell them that they they're out of time and for the athletes themselves. Um, particularly if you've got lots of friends and family. So, so please be committed and, and go right the way in on this. And one more thing I'd like to point out is that consistency. Um, I'm going to come, I'm going to come back to this in a moment in, in more detail, but there are no shortcuts. OK, you will see regularly in magazines and on blog posts and in podcasts, not mine, I hasten to add, but, but people saying, you know, shortcut to swimming faster, how to hack your run fitness. It's nonsense. No right minded coach. Who is helping people to do things the right way will tell you that there are any shortcuts. This is an endurance game. It takes a long time for the body to adapt. It takes a long time to do an outlaw event. You can't. You, you can't get there by doing five hours of training and swallowing a few pills. All right. So um, one thing that's really important is planning. So I talked about having a plan. It's not just a training plan. You, you need to have a plan for the team that's going to help you, right? Because you can't do this on your own. And if you think about, you know, you're entering outlaw world now. So there's a lot of people out there that can help you and would like to help you if you let them. But you have to ask. Okay, so wherever, and in, so in the outlaw world, in the idea outlaw world, um, everything and everyone's there to help you have the best possible race. You'll certainly find that on race day with our volunteers. They're second to none. But let's start with your family. I've lost count of the number of people who've told me they're doing an Ironman, but forgot to tell their wife before they entered or their husband. They just entered and then thought, oh, better tell the other half. Right? Think about the repercussions when you want to go out and do your long ride or your long run and your other half says, ah, but it's my turn to have a weekend away or a weekend off from the, you know, the family taxi business. Um, you're not going to get much support if you haven't communicated in advance. So 
um, it's important to communicate with your family what, what you would like to do, what your intention is, and how you would like their help going forwards. Think about, think about your children. You definitely don't want to become an outlaw, um, they, or you don't want them becoming an outlaw um, orphan while you're off training, but you can evolve them in your training. It's, it's, there's plenty of people I've seen that take the little, little ones out on the bikes while they go for a run and have them setting up little feed stations and everything. So there's, there's ways of evolving them. So please, please try and think about that because it'll make the whole journey more enjoyable. Um, medical. I have no doubt that some of you are going to get ill. We are going through very challenging times for people's health at the moment. The COVID situation is not getting any better at the moment. I'm, I'm pretty certain it will do. Um, but please don't be thinking you're going to be anywhere near getting a, a vaccine because if you're an out, if you're training for an outlaw, you're obviously in the, in that age bracket, um, where you're reasonably fit and at the bottom of the list. So, uh, you're going to have to look after your health in other ways, which means not compromise or not, not, um, not compromising your immune system by eating rubbish, not sleeping enough, and just doing too much training. So you've got a fine balancing act there. But there's also injury to think of. And when you get injured, if, if you get injured, you definitely don't want to be hanging around for several days waiting to, find, um, waiting to find out who the best physio is in your area that can treat you. You need to have made connection with those already. And while you're at it, go and see your GP. And if, if you, if it's your first time at this event and you're not sure if, you know, it's going to be, um, risky for your health, go and see your GP and tell him you'd like to have a, a bit of a well man or a well woman examination just to make sure you're okay. Um, don't worry about the hype about heart conditions. Um, I'm not saying that they're not important, but what I am saying is that most of those people who have, have problems like that, um, come to this, uh, are probably unrecognized and undiagnosed anyway but if you're at all worried go and get checked out first otherwise carry on training um then you've got to get your fitness sorted that's something we're going to talk about in more detail and then there's the other stuff what about your friends and your work colleagues I mean, it's, it's quite likely that when you're tired you might not want to put in a full shift at work and you might have to ask your colleagues to take the load so um let them know what you're doing bring them on board with the journey. If you make this journey interesting and share the stories and engage other people, you might find that you've got an awful lot of people who want to come to the outlaw finish line and cheer you on. And that is, that's absolutely fantastic. It's emo again, it's emotional. It's emotional for us commentating on the finish line and it's emotional for you when you cross that finish line. So definitely get as many people on board as you can so you can all enjoy the journey. And that's what it is, a journey. All right. Some other things before you start. I think you should spend a little bit of time writing down what are your strengths and weaknesses. Most triathletes will say, yeah, well, I'm not a very good swimmer. I'm strong on the bike. I'm an average runner. That's great. They're, they're pretty obvious, really, if you're a triathlete. But what about other stuff? Um, maybe you're not very good with nutrition. Maybe you eat too much junk food. Maybe you like alcohol a bit too much and you have a tendency to binge drink with your mates on a Friday and Saturday night. Um, maybe a strength is that you are stoic and you just put up with any amount of discomfort in order to get to the finish line. That can be a good and uh, a bad thing. Um, maybe you have had chronic back problems. That might be a weakness. Um, maybe you were, I don't know, maybe you're not very good at time management and so you, you're disorganized and you end up over committing and you can't get your training done. So understand, be brutally honest with yourself, understand your strengths and weaknesses and then have a clear goal. So from experience and observation over the 25 years, I would say that if you're coming into this race for the very first time uh, at this distance, whether that be the half or the full, your goal should be to finish. Please please try to avoid having a time goal. I can guarantee that if you've never done anything like this before, any time goal you have will be based on nothing more than putting your finger in the air and seeing which way the wind blows. It's no good saying I did a half in five hours, so if I double that and add 10%. It's not like that. The, the, the fatigue that you get in the second half of the run is exponential and you can, you, you can your race can go downhill like, yeah, like a, a heavy-duty go-kart um, very quickly. 
if you've got a friend who did the outlaw last year and you usually beat them in short distance races or you train with them, it's no good saying, well, he does this or she did that. So I reckon I can do this and I can do that and I can do that. And then I'll get that figure and then I'll take that figure and, you know, if you know cricket, you might as well just use the Duckworth Lewis method to work out how fast you're going to go, honestly. So for first timers, please just aim to get to the finish. And then when the clock stops for your finished photograph, that will be a personal best. And that will be great. If you have a time-based goal and you are outside that because the weather's against you, you'll probably be feeling miserable and you'll be thinking, oh, no, I dis I'm disappointed with that. Please don't be disappointed on finishing, crossing the finish line. And while we're on it, talking about finish line, see this thing here on your, on your on my wrist? Right, You're probably going to wear one of those. The worst thing you can do crossing the finish line is to do this. If you can still see me there, is to look at your watch instead of looking up and smiling with your hands aloft. Okay. Please don't let me or Lee or any of the other commentators catch you looking at your Garmin because we'll rip into you. We, we, we want you to have a great finishing photograph to remember. So you need to have clear goals. They need to be based on realism and experience. Now, if you've, if you've done an outlaw before and you're going back again, um, please take into account the difference in courses. The outlaw half is quite a flat course. Holcomb is, is undulating. Um, the one at Outlaw X is relatively flat, but the run's got a few hills. Um, the one in Outlaw Southwest is um, undulating, sporting course, I think. So, you know, you can't compare um, apples with oranges. So you need to have, um, after you've got your goals, so you need to have a training plan. So if you're writing your own, that's fine. Make sure it's based on your goals and, and the course knowledge that you have. And then break it down. What if I want to? If I want to do this, what does that mean? I need to do here. What does that mean? I need to do, here? and that tells you what you need to do today and tomorrow. And then you need to have a backup plan. Um, we'll come on to this later in swimming, but you might have plans to be a much faster swimmer next year. But what happens if? I mean, the pools are closed at the moment, but they might be opening at the beginning of December. We don't know. But what happens if we have another lockdown in February and pools close again for two months and you can't swim in the lead up to Outlaw Half? What will your plan be then? OK, you can't just, well, you might just throw it up in the air and, and, and throw your hands in the air and give up. But, but smart people have a backup plan and you also have to have a race strategy. Now, that's not something I'm going to touch on here. That's something for a later um, webinar. So um, we will uh, we'll talk about then. All right. Some of your biggest challenges. If you're stepping up a distance, you're probably going to be stepping up your training. So your biggest challenge is, one, avoiding injury. So we'll come on to that inconsistency. Two, getting rid of your current injury. Um, if you've got one already when you're starting, you definitely don't want to be starting an injury, so you're going to have to spend time sorting that out first. And if you get injured, then it's going to take you time to get rid of that injury. Um, swimming seems to be a continuing problem for the most uh, for most triathletes moving up. I'd say probably 75 to 80% of people. Um, have a bigger hang up about swimming than anything else. So s swimming is a big challenge. Balancing work and life and training uh, are going to be a challenge for you. Um, and you can factor into that time management. Um, training, getting the training done, keeping the motivation and that final thing, motivation there. Now, motivation does wane, but, but there's a reason for that generally motivation starts to drop when you get tired, when you're not recovering. So that if, if you are finding that you're just like, oh, I can't do this anymore, can't bring myself to get out on the bike, you get home from work and you'd rather sit and have a cup of tea and have a nap on the sofa with the dog or with you, you know, sit and chat with your kids. Um, look at what's happening with your training and your, and your life overall if you start to lose motivation. That one, of the, one of the most sad saddening things I see as a coach is when people are coming into their first big race and they're saying, I just want to get it over with now. I want to be done with it. That's not how it should be. This should be an exciting journey. It should be like the, the trip of a lifetime that you've been waiting for and you can't wait to get it done. Not, I can't wait to get it over with. So um, if you start to lose your motivation, please look at your whole life and see whether you're just doing too much and then work out what you can 
what you can let go of in order to find some motivation. And, and sometimes that might have to be the training. So uh, think about this. Two little dogs, they're sleeping. Animals are great, aren't they? They run around like mad things. And then when, when they get back, they go to sleep. And then they're ready to run around again. So it's not about how much training or running around you can do. It's how much you can recover from. I think a lot of people forget that, you know, they think, well, I can do 15 hours a week. We can all do 15 hours a week when the opportunity presents itself. But can you recover from that? And can you recover from it consistently? And if the answer's no, then 15 hours a week is too much for you right now. Okay, uh, I'm just going to jump out of sharing the screen for a moment. And, um, oops, let's go back a little bit. Um, escape. So we're going to stop sharing. And I want to see if there's any questions. Right. Um, if there's any questions, would uh, would you like to type them in as, we, as we're going along? I can answer a couple now if there's any. It's all very silent on there. Can everyone still hear me? Just somebody type in. Yes, thank you, Simon. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, James, Tracy, Carl, Claire, Kezia. All right, I can see you. So if there's no question, oh, hold on. Q&A, yeah. What split do you recommend? Uh, Laura, you asked what split do I recommend. Can you just expand on that a little bit for me? Just type it into the chat box if you wouldn't mind. That's Laura Clark. between the three disciplines. Uh, it, well, it depends on where your strengths and weaknesses are. I would, I would start off with around with 45% of your total hour. Um, so uh, actually, I'll tell you what, Laura, let, I'll come back to that when I cover, I'll make a note here. I'll come back to that when I cover, uh, I cover the swimming, biking and running, if, that, if that's okay. Right, I'll get you in a bit, Laura. I've made a note there. Okay, all right, I'm going to dive out of this now then. And we're going to go back to sharing the screen and back to... Yeah, Deborah. Um, Louise Sinclair, pools are still open in Scotland. How many sessions a week do you recommend over the winter? I'll come to that in the swim-specific bit. Deborah Brandt, can I talk about recovery a bit more? I am going to do absolutely that before we start talking about training, Deborah. Um, it's coming up right now. So let's go back to sharing the screen and talk about this. All right. Need to get rid of that. Okay, right. The pyramid. So this, for those psychologists among you, or those who remember doing this um, at school, this is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Stephen Seiler does a similar one, which I've shared, but this is my own adaptation based on how I think um, you should be sort of aligning your thoughts around training. Okay. So before you do anything, I think that the foundation for healthy living, so this bit at the bottom, physio assessment and MOT, nutrition coaching or nutri attention to nutrition um, and mobility and strength, and in there you can put recovery in there if you like. They're the most important things that you need to have nailed. What, what generally happens is that um, people enter for an event and then they dive into the training. And then when it starts to unravel after a while, or they're not, they're not making progress, they then start going backwards to, oh, well, um, yeah, the reason why I don't run as fast as I could is because I'm tight in the hips. So that would have been, that would have been um, highlighted in a physio assessment. Or the reason why they're not recovering from hard training sessions is because their nutrition is below average and so that would have been highlighted in the nutrition assessment or they keep getting calf injuries and the physio assessment would probably have identified that as well and then with the addition of some mobility and strength work 
you could have overcome that problem. So it's better to address these problems first or issues. And if you remember in, in uh, the slide I shared five minutes ago, I talked about strengths and weaknesses. Um, physical strengths and weaknesses would be uh, identified with the physio assessment and nutrition strengths and weaknesses will be addressed with an assessment of your daily um, food intake. And these are the foundations for healthy living. So those of you who've heard my podcast, you will know that I'm very strong on focusing on what's, what's right and healthy for you as a human being first and then adding fitness on top of that. Okay, so for those of you in lockdown or end of season recovery, um, now's a good time to start thinking about all these foundational aspects. And then what we do is we start to layer on some triathlon coaching um, and some swim bike run stuff and then we start adding on some technical skills to enhance your swim bike and run training and then we get busy with the hard work now hard work doesn't mean training hard as in breathing hard and sweating a lot hard work means doing everything and the easy bit swim bike and run the bits i'm going to talk about in a minute the stretching the mobility the strength work the going to bed early the you know cutting down the alcohol that's hard work too Right. So all of those things below the dotted line, the black dotted line, they're the ones that are really important. The other stuff above is a bit of fluff, really. So I see lots and lots of posts on Facebook pages for people asking, you know, how can I what, what GPS watch should I get? Do you know what? This is a Sunto. I don't have a Garmin. I'm an ambassador for Sunto, by the way, just just for dec uh, just for um, declaration. It measures how far I've run. It measures how far I've cycled and swum. It tells me how fast. I don't really look at it during training, but it all uploads into training peaks, and then I look at it later. A Garmin will do that. An Apple Watch will do that. A Timex will do that. A Polar will do that, right? I, I, one's probably better than the other. I know not which because I'm not concerned because they all do the basics well. Equally, I'm not bothered about which power meter's right or even whether you should have one if you're not doing enough training. I don't mind if you want to boil your spinach or if you want to steam your spinach, but I think you should start by eating spinach. Um, some of you are probably giggling at that one because I've told it before, but I, you know, splitting hairs about which is the best way um, comes second to actually getting it done. Equally, you might want to have a VO2 max test, but VO2 max is a vanity figure. It has no relationship to your, um, certainly not to your outlaw distance performance, really, unless you're operating at the very top end. Um, it's a nice little thing to know, um, but does it make any difference on race day? No, there'll be people with a lower VO2 max beating you. I can tell you that. Um, and again, aero wheels, vapor fly training shoes, all of that stuff is icing on the cake. If you're not doing the training, no amount of, no amount of fancy aero kit is going to make up the, the time you, or the fitness you could have got if you just got the work done. So focus on these things in dark blue below the, dotted line first and you have my personal guarantee that you'll get where you want um, then when you've started getting the basics right on a regular basis you can move on to the stuff at the top okay right so Deborah you asked about recovery so recovery is one of those foundational aspects that I find extremely important dare I say a priority above doing your swim bike and run Obviously, you've got to do those to recover, but but most people forget about this bit. So it includes all of the following. Sleeping, obviously, is the best way to recover from training. So again, buy some Normatec boots if you like, but don't buy them when you're only getting four hours sleep a night. Work out how to get more sleep before you spend the money on the Normatec boots. Relaxation. By relaxation, I sometimes, you know, can sometimes include just sitting down and emptying your mind. Meditation, you can call it meditation if you like, if you want to do formal practice. But just the act of disengaging from electronics and reading a book, not watching the telly or looking at your iPad or answering emails, but just disengaging and reading a book, shutting off your mind. Okay, meditation, meditation works as well. Nutrition helps to fuel you, of course it does, but it also helps your body to recover and it's important that you're eating the right foods because eating the wrong foods can lead to inflammation of the muscles and that might be delaying your recovery a little bit. Staying hydrated, very important. So 
if you've got a drink, here's a drink stop. Let's let's all hydrate right now. Okay, massage. I don't know if sports massage is essential. It's a nice luxury. If it helps you to relax, if it helps your heart rate to drop, if it helps your HRV, um, if you can afford to have a regular massage, then that's great. I'm not sure it's a primary mover in injury prevention. It would certainly help if you've got a good masseur who can identify certain knots. Uh, I prefer a, a regular, a monthly visit to see the physio to identify those, though, um, not the massage. But massage definitely helps with relaxation. Um, so if that's your if that's your particular thing, then keep doing it. And definitely stretching and mobility, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. And here's a comment that um, uh, a great age group return pro, Gordo Byrne, made. He said, athletes that get injured all the time, they generally don't stretch, they generally don't get a massage, they generally don't sleep very well. And athletes that get sick all of the time tend not to back off enough, tend not to sleep very well, tend to eat rubbish food. Gordo's a coach. Those are just observations, not criticisms. I'd agree with him. Okay, more on recovery, but the most important part of recovery is sleep. So it's worth paying attention to this. Um, if you're not able to get the eight or nine hours sleep that's recommended every night, then at least try to be consistent with your bedtime and your waking time. Um, the experts seem to be in agreement that trying to make up for sleep at the weekend by getting, you know, 10 hours, uh, if you're only getting six hours a night during the week, um, doesn't work quite like that. Um, it's probably better than nothing, but, uh, Try to be consistent with bedtime and waking time if you can. I realize that some of you might work shifts and that that will get in the way and that's a whole different strategy altogether. Um, the sleep experts I've had on my podcast and I've listened to talk about pre and post sleep routines. And actually, it, the most important thing is what you do when just after you've got up. Um, very difficult in the winter in the UK, but getting as much bright light as possible. So if you can get outside and go for a walk, um, if you ride and you ride in the daylight, try to avoid wearing your sunglasses uh, at least for 20 minutes to get some proper natural daylight into your eyes. Um, if you aren't in that privileged position, then it might be worth getting one of these um, seasonal affective disorder lamps um, that you can have in your room to give you some bright light or maybe even some of these little things called human chargers, which like a like a pair of um, iPod speakers and they put they fit into your ears and they emit light and it gets into your um, the cells in your ears and and uh, and into your brain that way but what you do first thing in the morning can actually have a big impact on how you get to sleep in an evening so maybe try to avoid looking at your phone for the first 30 to 45 minutes how many people are sitting there shaking their head saying that's impossible it's not it just requires discipline um yeah a big a big no no is to cut back on sleep to squeeze in more training try and avoid that so again when when the days get a bit longer and you starting to up the training volume in the spring you might be thinking well i could get up a bit earlier well that's fine if you're going to go to bed earlier but if you're going to go to bed at 10 and you're going to get up an hour earlier then um, you're robbing peter to pay paul that never really works um but if you do need to try and find more time to sleep, then little power naps can work. So if you can, if you can get one of those um, during the day, please do. Okay, Deborah, uh, hopefully that answered your questions. A lot of the recovery stuff's about getting the basics right. Um, if there's anything else you want, uh, please just put something in the Q&A tab and I will answer that if I can. Okay. All right. Um, okay, the next thing then, consistency is the key. Most definitely, if you listen to pro athletes talking, um, they will say that the reason behind their great performances this season, last season, etc., was consistency, that they didn't miss a day of training. It's absolutely the number one determinant of your race performance, especially if you're limited for time. Because if you're limited for time, you need to make the most of every single bit of of uh, time that you have for training. You definitely don't want to be missing sessions. 
it's not, it's not a huge problem if you do miss sessions, as you'll see in a minute from a graphic I've got, but um, you definitely don't want to be like this. So if you look on that graph, you'll see that there are two lines. The blue line represents the hair variety of triathlete. Now the hair, as you can see, uh, the hair and the tortoise start at the, uh, the same point. Um, this is their, if you're familiar with training peaks, this is their TSS or their chronic training load. So you'll see that the hair and the tortoise start off around 50, but the hair accelerates rapidly, doing some big weeks and seemingly having a higher level of fitness by December than the tortoise. Unfortunately, he sort of overstretched himself and or herself, and so the hair now gets a little bit of a sore throat and has to back off and, uh, and miss out on training. And so the fitness declines so that by January, you can see that if you look in the vertical line there, the tortoise who's just taken a steady approach is now slightly ahead. But that's not going to stop the hair because Mr. Miss, Mr. or Mrs. Hair, fresh from their bit of a break, now comes steaming back, eager to get back to their previous fitness and beyond and overtake the tortoise. So you can see that they do really well until the beginning of March. And now they've got a higher level of fitness than the tortoise who's carried on the same steady, you know, improved by or increased training by uh, a couple of percent each week. But unfortunately, the, the hare then starts to go into his uh, race specific training. He adds some high intensity intervals and the hare then gets injured. He gets an ankle injury, can't do any cycling. It makes it a bit, or he gets a knee injury. So he can't do any sw uh, running. Cycling's difficult, can only swim. So fitness declines again. So it's dropped into April. It's only just ahead of the January level now, look. And of course, the tortoise is still continuing on his slow but merry way forwards. So by the time they get to May and the start of the race season, the tortoise is actually fitter than the hare. All right. So consistent in green for the tortoise or stop start for the hare. Which one are you now? Which one would you like to be? So if you get it right, if you are Mrs. or Mr. Tortoise, you might have a training wall. This is the wall that you're building. Every session is a brick. So every session that you complete is a green brick. So you can see the wall is full of green bricks. Every session of, that's, that's a green zone training session, by the way. That's in the 80-20 world. That's one of the 80% of sessions, and there's about 80% of those bricks are green. That's one of those sessions that gets done around 70% at math, if you like, um, feels nice and easy, feels too easy sometimes. And so you think you'll go a bit harder. The red sessions are the high intensity training sessions. So they're planned. They are about, they, they make up one in every five sessions once you've built an aerobic base and you will have a scattering of those as well. You'll also notice some orange bricks in there. Now the orange bricks are the ones where when you were supposed to be doing a green session, you pushed a little bit too hard because you were feeling guilty. So it was kind of hard or because you were doing that too often when it came to doing a red session, you couldn't go hard enough. So it became kind of hard, right? So you don't like the green really easy. You don't like that red really, really sickeningly hard. So you opt for orange, but I did in an ideal training plan. We wouldn't have many oranges and some of those orange sessions would end up in there by accident. Um, if you were on a really hilly ride or it was really windy and you had to fight your way back and you, you, you know, you just had to go at a threshold intensity just to keep moving. Um, that's what happens sometimes. Now you'll also notice that there's the occasional white session. Now they, these are the missed sessions. These are the ones that, you, um, you might miss because you have to go and pick one of your kids up from school unexpectedly, or you have to stay late at work because you've got to, um, finish a project, right? As you can see, the occasional missed session doesn't really alter the integrity of the wall. It's not going to fall down if there's a few little holes in it. If there were half the bricks were white, then we'd have a very weak wall. So the moral of that story is if you miss the occasional session, don't worry about it. Just let it go. It happens to everybody. I can guarantee everybody right up to the very highest level of athletes. It happens. So you miss a session. It happens, get on with it, move on to the next one. Okay, um, another point to do with 
um, recovery and to do with building a foundation is mobility and strength. So mobility is what we get around the joints. Stretch, stretching effect, affects the muscle fibers and lengthens them. But mobility is the, is the, um, the movement and freedom you have around a joint or a series of joints. And sometimes mobility is like, it's like stretching with slight movements as well. Um, yoga works good for mobility. Um, Pilates is okay, but I, I think more Pilates is more controlled muscle movements. So I will prefer yoga or I will just prefer some regular um, mobility come stretching activity. Um, when you do improve the range of movement around a joint, you get better efficiency. That enables you to move better. So you can move without using as much energy. So you run and you swim better. Um, you'll be more streamlined in the water. So it'll definitely help you swim better if you're more mobile around the hips and the shoulders and the upper back. And it really contributes to injury prevention. And you should be thinking about 15 minutes of mobility work for every 60 minutes of training. So for those of you who are aiming for 10 hours a week of training, you want to find another two and a half hours of mobility, which is a roughly 20 minutes a day. Could be broken down to two tens or four fives or 10 lots of two minutes or 20 lots of one minutes. I don't mind. Just do it. Please do not ignore it. And then once you've got the mobility, then think about strength training. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about your typical bodybuilding, go in the gym, do three sets of 10 bench press and squats and bicep curls. That's not what I'm about. I'm thinking about the little muscles around the ankles, um, about around calf strength, around stability in the upper back so you can hold your swim form for longer when you get tired. Okay, and if you can improve the strength around those areas, then your movement and your performance of uh, various movements will be more efficient and it will help with injury prevention. So for somebody who asked, uh, or if you didn't, you should have done two to three times a week year round, please, with, with more priority at this time of year and slightly less towards the race season. But definitely it's a year round thing. And... Um, just for our older athletes, uh, definitely females who are coming up to the menopause or are in post-menopause, um, you might want to be thinking about a little less cardiovascular work and, little, and lifting heavier weights, a la Stacey Sims and others. There's a big um, consensus on that one and a bit of momentum building there. Likewise, for our older male athletes, you might find that performance improvements come more from doing, spending time in the gym than spending more time on your bike. All right, I'm going to jump out of this now then and see if there are any questions. Um, James Chalmers, nutrition partner for Outlaw. High five. Always has been, always will be, as long as everybody's alive. <laughs> as in, they're not going anywhere. But don't worry about that right now. You will, get, you will get high five on race day. I'm going to talk about nutrition in a minute. Um, there's a few Q&As. So, uh, okay, Simon Compton, I'll come back to that. Laura Clark, do you always have one day off a week? Or if you cycle through distance, is it okay to go longer without a day off? Um, um, right. Okay. Uh, these questions I will come back to in a minute. Um, they're not really concerning um, current current stuff. Let's go on to nutrition. If anyone's got any nutrition questions, post those. Apart from um, apart from uh, James's question about the nutrition, so I've, I've given you that one. It's high five. I'll talk about that um, um, stuff in a little bit more. And Claire Hassler asked, "Can I touch more on menopause training?" Okay. Um, I'll come back to that in a bit, Claire, if I can, and maybe at the end. So let's go back to sharing and let's talk about nutrition. All right, make no mistake, nutrition can make a big difference to your recovery and therefore towards your performance improvements. Shoot me down if you like. I'm here to be shot at. I'll put my hands up as a sort of please don't shoot me. So if you can see that, I'm sort of saying, you know, I don't want to be shot. But hey, try and shoot me down if you like, because I've got answers for these. But 
I would say that you should try to avoid popular diets like keto or paleo or low carb, high fat. I can pretty much guarantee that 90% of you have got loads of improvements you can make with just normal everyday eating before you need to try those. Somebody's probably going to tell me that keto is great for weight loss. I agree, but it's not great for weight loss for people who are doing triathlon training at the same time. It was never meant for that. It was never meant as a weight loss product. It's just people have just realized that. And it's, and it's good for weight loss because it's restrictive on what you can eat. Okay, uh, but also if you follow keto for long enough, you might find that you put that weight on because once you learn what you can eat, you just eat more of it. Paleo again, what is paleo? You know, paleo is different things to different tribes living in different parts of the world. And, you know, if you really want to be paleo, get rid of your electricity, go and live in a cave, um, do persistence hunting, all of that stuff. You know, paleo is just trendy. Um, ancestral eating is, is maybe a better term for it. Um, I don't mind that. Um, low carb, high fat. I, I confess I've tried that. I like low carb, high fat, but equally, I think that you have to understand what low carb means and what it means for you and um, whether it's actually going to work for you. It doesn't work for everybody, but I do think low carb, high fat is a fairly good approach. But I would say that there is still lots of things that you could do before you go down those roads. In fact, these are the things I think you should try to do first. Focus on human performance, not weight loss. So focus on you as the human being. What do you need to do as a, what do you need to eat as a 50 year old female who's gone through the menopause? Not the same as a 50 year old male and definitely not the same as a 30 year old male or female. Um, what do you need to do for somebody who works shifts, doesn't get much sleep and has a, a manual job? You know, how do you need to eat there in order to make sure you've got the energy to do your job? Um, for those people who require mental acuity, what sort of foods do you need to eat? I would think in general, if you follow the rules, moderation, wholesomeness and diversity or variety, you'll be on the right track. And these should be mostly, I should have underlined that, mostly nutrient dense, real foods. Um, I'm not, again, uh, somebody asked a question about sports nutrition. I'm not a great fan of the term sports nutrition um, and I'm definitely not a big fan of sports nutrition products most of the time. Occasionally in races, that's fine. And obviously learning what works for you and what doesn't. But, you know, if, if you're going through life with an energy bar in your pocket and you're using that instead of having real food for lunch, you need to sort yourself out, I think. Um, and equally, if you're getting into a club ride on a Sunday morning and after 45 minutes, you're reaching for a, a high five bar or a power bar or some other sort of bar. Um, I'd be having a look at what you're actually doing with your nutrition or whether you're just eating because you think you should. Um, <clears throat> okay. Also, please don't get too hung up uh, about being a saint about your eating. If you eat whole, some real food that you've prepared yourself 90% of the time, you can afford to um, let it slide for 10% of the time. However, what I would say, and this is worth doing right now, is if, if you have any food intolerances, if you're diabetic, type 1 or type 2, um, or if you have any other food issues, then it's definitely worth seeing a specialist, a, a nutritionist or um, a clinical dietitian, if you like. Um, I'm a nutrition coach, but I'm not, in the same, I'm not at the same level of learning and understanding those people. But I can help most people solve the problems. So some other things just to be thinking about <clears throat> uh, with nutrition planning and preparation is the key. Simply make a menu of what foods you want to eat during the week, what meals you want to, to eat. Then go through your cupboards and your fridge. Find out what you've got, what you haven't got. If you've got it, cross it off your food list. If you haven't got it, it's left there. Circle it, go to the shop, buy those foods. Then prepare the foods that you can on the Sunday. Do some batch cooking. Um, chop up your vegetables so they're ready, um, make some soups, uh, whatever. And then each morning, take the thing out of the freezer, you know, set aside some time to prepare your food. Um, cook, cook larger portions for dinner so that you've got leftovers to have for lunch the next day. Always a good way. If you're roasting vegetables then, um, and you like an omelette in the morning before you go to work, then you can cook too many, cook too many vegetables and have those with your omelette. Eat complete lean protein each time you eat. 
Uh, if I was to look at most people's food diaries, I would see that there's a tiny little bit of protein in the morning, usually coming from um, some milk, maybe, and maybe some maybe some uh, some eggs from some people or some Greek yogurt, but probably not enough. And then maybe a little bit more protein at lunchtime, and then a lot of protein in the evening. Try to have it leveled out throughout the day. So that might mean a new approach to your um, food in the morning. Um, I think it's important to love healthy fats. Um, I am actually, I've not got a list of those now, but I could probably uh, get hold of a list of healthy fats and things that you should have, be having more in your diet um, if you want. Um, but, but you need to do your research, find out what healthy fats are and make sure that they are more in your diet. And if you were following the keto diet, you'd be eating 80%. Um, you'd be consuming 80% of your diet as fat. Uh, try to eat vegetables every time you eat five a day is your starter everybody should be eating at least five vegetable um, portions of veg a day maybe 10 okay the vegetarians will probably and the plant-based eaters will probably tell me they are already but we should all be doing that um, carbohydrates are the answer not the enemy when you're doing lots of endurance training you do need carbohydrates from time to time as a cyclical addition to your nutrition in order to restore energy balance. It is possible if you follow a very low carbohydrate diet to restore um, glycogen through uh, back channel processes, but they take a bit of time um, and it requires a fair amount of preparation and, and time management to do that. But I would say that you definitely shouldn't, and this is where I target the sports nutrition, um, avoid refined sugars, avoid processed foods. It, uh, you know, quite frankly, if you are using, if, if you've got the time to cook real food and you're using sports nutrition to get your calories in, it's just um, most, for most of the time, I, I consider it to be lazy. On the people that I've observed that do that, it's just like, oh, I'll just take one of these instead because it's easier. For easy, substitute lazy. Um, focus on whole foods. And again, uh, Confirming what I said about don't be a saint, um, have the 10% food. So if you like a pizza on a Friday night, that's fine. If you like to get a curry, that's fine. Um, not every night. If you like fish and chips, occasionally, you know, once a month, that's fine. Um, have a beer, that's fine. Um, having a beer every night, probably going a bit too far the other way. Having a small glass of wine every night, probably better because of great polyphenols. Um, but probably best to have a few nights without any alcohol to let your liver have a break. Um, and binge drinking. And Ironman, Outlaw, Distance, Triathlon probably don't go together really very well. <clears throat> uh, okay, right. Let's just jump out of this, see if there's any uh, questions. And then we'll talk about training. So I see there's a few more questions coming here. Um, uh, yeah, Mark, Mark Harris. Yeah, that, that is a racing question. I would train the body to burn mostly fat. You know, um, you probably won't, most people probably can't operate for six, well, four, six, eight, ten 10 hours in a carb burning zone. Um, and you do need to consume a lot of carbohydrates at that point, And that's when it can become an overload on the stomach and you end up with gastro problems. Um, learning to burn fat and the best long distance athletes in any sport are, are the best fat burners. So learning to, learning to burn fat and use fat as a fuel and have some metabolic flexibility is always a good thing. Um, and then you can keep drip feeding the carbohydrates in as you're going along to make sure you're just not dropping too low. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to come back to those training questions in a moment because now we're going to go on to the training. So uh, let's jump out of those. Deborah, did I answer your, Deborah Brandt, did I answer your question about recovery okay or do you need um, or do you need a bit more? Just just type in and let me know. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. I see that. Okay. Right, let's go back then. Back to training. So I mentioned that I had adapted Stephen Siler's uh, um, pyramid. So this is again back to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is actually this is the Stephen Siler one here. So, 
look at the stuff in dark blue at the bottom, right? Similar to the one I shared before. The most important thing that you can do, and this is really a very good thing to be considering for right now in the year, is to just train regularly and consistently. Again, as, as with fancy training gear and aero stuff, people are worried about the small stuff, the icing, rather than just getting on with making the basic ingredients of the cake. So focus on total frequency and volume of training, not total, that's my spelling error. So just get out there training regularly and consistently. If you have 10 hours a week, make the most of those 10 hours. Uh, of which about an hour of that sh of that 10 hours should be strength and conditioning, by the way. Um, never do more swim, cycling and running so, so that you push out the strength work. The strength work needs to be in there as a priority. So if it's 10 hours a week and that's divided up as seven or eight sessions, get those seven or eight sessions in. If you can build six to eight weeks of just training like that without any high intensity, you will get fitter. You will. Trust me. If you've managed to do that for six to eight weeks and you, let's say you've got to Christmas and you've managed all your sessions, you haven't missed one, you've averaged 10 hours a week on your, on your big weeks and then you average seven hours a week on your recovery weeks, try adding some high intensity training. Just put them in randomly. You know, if you're having a good day, just, just put some high intensity efforts in. Really high intensity, like 95% effort. Short duration. 30 to 60 seconds is all you need with similar length recoveries. Maybe do eight or 10 of them and then add one per week. No need to do any more than that. Just add one per week every time you do them and do them randomly. And then if that's working all right for you, maybe, maybe in January, or February, be a bit more precise with the intervals, make it 90, 10. That, that's, that's a total time. But, but let's talk about uh, Let's talk about 80-20. So if you've got 10 sessions a week, two of them could be high-intensity training, maybe a run and a bike or a, a bike and a swim or something. If you can do all of that to Outlaw, to your chosen Outlaw event, you will get really close to your goal. You might even exceed it. Steven Seiler said that it's well-established in research, with lots of research, that the first three form the foundation of the pyramid work best, okay? Those higher up the pyramid may work, so having a periodized program, you know, that might work, but does it work any better than any other way of organizing it? Maybe not. Um, you could try a reverse periodization, as some people call it, just reverse periodization just seems like a normal periodization for me for long distance racing. Don't worry too much about the way in which you organize your training. If you've got a normal nine to five working week, that's great. Or if you're retired, that's great. But if you've got shift works um, or weird working patterns, then a general periodization won't work for you anyway. Um, so a fancy training plan, the current diet at the moment or super specificity with heart rate or power should come later. Just train regularly to the occasional intervals and follow a healthy diet, eating real food with minimal sugar, and avoid alcohol and get plenty of sleep. Right? Those are the those are the ingredients to doing really well. Um, the sports specific training, that's later on. Altitude, playing around with altitude if you can, having an altitude tent, playing around with heat acclimatization, messing around with fasted training or sleeping low. Great, pacing and training and all of that stuff, and then tapering, which is the one right at the very top. They're, they all work, but they won't really work very well unless you've done the bottom three. So just focus on those for now. Right, swim guidelines. So I'm gonna jump in and out of these now because I did see some questions. So swim guidelines. Some people see swimming as a warm up for the bike. Um, it might be. I think you should actually be warmed up before you get in the swim. Otherwise, you spend the first 20 minutes um, warming up the cardiovascular system. So it is really a warm-up for the bike, but you're not making the most of the swim. Um, if, you, if you're going for position or time or you're doing a longer-distance race, then it's actually a significant factor in the race. So please don't, uh, please don't diminish the value of the swim. Um, keys for this time of year. 
identify what's wrong with your stroke when you can get back in the pool or for those people in Scotland who are lucky enough to be in the pool or still um, identify what's wrong with your stroke, which means you probably need somebody to video you and somebody who knows what they're talking about to be able to tell you um, what's wrong. And then that same person perhaps to be able to give you some guidance on what you can do to correct it. Okay. So video identification of flaws, correction of flaws, coaching somebody who can see you regularly doesn't need to be every week could be once a month but somebody who gets eyes on you regularly so you don't develop bad habits work on developing efficiency i think far too many people want to swim fast you can swim efficiently and actually get much quicker um one thing that most people overlook even with a wetsuit is streamlining so the mobility we talked about earlier will really pay dividends it, particularly if you can work on um being more mobile around the hip flexors so that you don't have um, legs that appear to drag. That's, that's a big, a big issue for people. So um, make sure that once the pools are open, you swim consistently. So a couple of two or three sessions of a couple of kilometers are better than one and a half big sessions a week. Um, your first goal, if you're, a, uh, if, if you're not confident is to make sure you can cover the distance comfortably in, in the set time. And again, going back to this, mobility leads to better streamlining, which means there's reduced drag, which means you become a faster swimmer. Um, for, those, for those of us who don't have access to the pools or if the pools get closed again, then I definitely recommend investing in some stretch cords and doing some dry land work. If, uh, I'll, what we'll do tomorrow is I will email you with details of where you can get the um, the recording of this and I will also pass on uh, cords and swim uh, cords video that I did to show you some of the exercises okay right escape no let's get out of screen sharing actually let's get onto this now Right, Laura Clark, I'm going to answer your question now. What split do I recommend between the three disciplines? I would say for people who've got a balanced uh, approach, 45% of your time spent cycling. So that gives 55% of your hours left. So I would spend 25% um, of that swimming and 30% running. You definitely don't need to run as much as you think you do. Um, most people are hampered on the, on the run because, um, because they've overcooked it on the bike. Um, um, Laura says, do you always have one whole day off per week? Uh, it depends, Laura, how stressful your life is, how you feel like you recover. Um, I know some of the pros or some of the people doing large volume probably don't have a day off or they use what's called recovery on demand. So they have a, a better feel for their body and they know when to take a day off. Um, so they might have a light swim. The problem is that if you don't take a day off a lot and you haven't got intensity discipline, what's supposed to be a really easy session can turn into uh, a really hard session if you end up trying to chase somebody else. So it's it, a lot of that depends on whether you trust yourself. Um, I would say that uh, probably for age group triathletes that are working, probably having one day off um, per week is, is a good thing. Uh, Win Thomas, I keep getting told you need a TT bike to be the best at an outlaw. Is this true? Well, if you, if there was, Two evenly matched athletes and they wanted to be age group champion. The one on the aero bike would probably post a faster bike split and put less effort in doing so and probably have a better run. Okay. Um, however, um, so in, in the truest sense of the word, yes, if you want to be the best at an outlaw, then you would probably want to have a TT bike. However, if you can only afford a road bike or an aero road bike or one road bike that alternates between um, your race bike, then that's fine. You'll still be able to, uh, you'll still be able to finish and you'll probably still be able to set PBs by getting stronger. But ultimately you, you may want to consider an investment in a TT bike. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, anonymous attendee. I am conscious of adding. So you know who you are. I'm conscious of adding speed work to running to avoid injury at the moment. 
Um, how far out should I start reintroducing speed work for the full distance? Okay, so um, I don't think that speed work necessarily causes injury. If you transition to too much speed work too quickly, it's more likely that you will get injured. But um, when I talked to Alison Rose, and she stated this several times on a podcast I've done with Al Alison's work with Jessica Ennis, with Kelly Holmes, and also with uh, the Olympic triathletes in Leeds, um, her three biggies for getting in most most injuries in triathlon are caused by running, right? So let's let's identify that first. 70, 70 to eighty <clears> percent <throat> of injuries caused by running, and of those, the three biggest reasons for getting injured are poor technique, doing too much too soon, so adding in too much volume or too much speed work too soon, or lack of strength. And that lack of strength is lack of strength around the hips that, that stabilize the knees and the ankles, um, lack of strength around the calves and the ankles to cope with the running volume. So what I would look at before you start adding speed work is what your ankle mobility is like and your ankle strength and your ankle stability and your hip stability. And then I would start, once you've built up an aerobic base, I would start introducing speed work. So now we have to define what we mean by speed work because to me, speed work is sessions or efforts that you do that are less than 30 seconds right so maybe anonymous attendee you could actually send me another comment and tell me what event you're training for and then i'll and then i'll define speed work for you but generally speed work is is running 100 to 200 meters as fast as possible or running for 20 to 30 seconds as fast as possible and getting the limbs moving really really quickly right if you're talking about doing one kilometer intervals on the track at your 10k pace that's not speed work that's threshold work it's muscular endurance but it's not speed work okay so that you, uh, it's important to understand the physiological definition of those um speed work is short uh it doesn't induce too much fatigue and it is done just to increase limb speed okay um right I will, Simon Compton, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just going to come back to you when we do the running section, which is coming up soon. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, anonymous attendee. How far out should I start reintroducing speed work for the full distance? Do you know what? Speed work for a 26-mile run at the end of a bike. Um, add a little bit, if you like. I would say... Um, unless you're thinking about running yeah if you can run sub three hours that is um what's that's about seven minutes per mile is that speed work i think you could probably already run seven minutes per mile or you know 400 meters at seven minutes per mile pace so you're already there um what i would be doing is spending more time in the gym so you can the speed you start at or the pace you start at on the run you can continue that through the second half of the run so doing work to avoid getting slower rather than trying to get faster. Okay, let's go back to um, the cycling. Let's see, get rid of this thing here. Stop sharing a moment. Go back to sharing. Go back to that. Right, here we go. All right, on to biking. Single biggest contributor to your race result, which is why 45% of your time. Bike volume is biggest influence on finish time, without a doubt. Um, at the moment, I would just say get your road riding in. Somebody did ask me the question by email earlier, is it better to do, does it matter if I do turbo training work in the winter? I would say right now it doesn't matter. If the weather's not very good, if you're uncomfortable about going out and slippery or dismal roads or there's not very good lighting or the surface is poor it's fine you're building fitness at the moment and time on the bike if you want to ride your mountain bike throughout the winter instead of your road bike i have no objection to that um, you build great leg strength you build fantastic handling skills it doesn't matter how fast you're going it's the duration and the intensity which are the important elements so don't don't get into the ego game of mileage just just time on the bike um equally it's not necessary to do super long rides throughout the winter either. Um, you know, regular three to four hour rides maximum is fine. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to use your indoor trainer, 
um, that's fine. I would say the only limitation with that is that you don't learn how to handle a bike in poorer weather conditions or on poorer road surfaces. So learning how to corner in the wet, learning how to ride in the wind, that sort of stuff. Um, so it is worth it is worth the occasional ride outdoors. Um, if you live in a hilly area, then definitely hit the hills regularly. It's good for leg strength. Um, if you don't, then you could consider at some point doing over gear work where you put the bike in a big gear and, and really grind out, um, you know, the minutes at 50, 60 RPM and get a bike fit. Not, this isn't just reserved for your, your race bike, get a bike fit on the bike. You're going to spend lots of time riding in the winter. It's just as important to, to have the right position for your winter road bike. Okay. Onto the run. Um, so I, I think I've mentioned it, but I'll say it again. Your biggest challenge is actually avoiding injury. Um, 70, 20%, 80% of tri injuries related to running, um, generally down to lack of technique and strength or in appropriate volume. So doing too much too soon. Um, the run on the half probably starts in the last 10 K in the full probably starts in the last 10 miles. Um, and that's when you've got to try and preserve the speed you have rather than go faster. So a lot of people are trying to learn how to run faster in training. Most of them are already running at the pace quite comfortably on an easy run that they're going to sustain for the outlaw. And they'll be able to do that for the first half and then it all starts to go south. So what you've got to do is learn and, and work on how to preserve the pace that you have. As I mentioned, big volume is not critical. It's consistency. Um, I think that most people could do more run drills and I think most people could do more gym work and that will improve economy and efficiency. And that's with the cycling run the hills to build leg strength. Now don't, don't start. This is where you can come on un, unstuck with a kit with Achilles problems. Don't hit the hills every session straight away, you know, build up to them, but definitely just be running them easy and learning to learning to run uphill with economy and learning to run downhill with a bit of fluency. Okay. That's it. So just a few things on my summary, and then I'll come back to answering any questions. So as I said at the beginning, most plans will work. You just need to find a program that works for you and stick to it. Be consistent in what you do. Be consistent with your training. Be consistent with your recovery. Be consistent with your nutrition. Okay. Do the basics right. Anybody can be a world champion at getting the basics right. You do not need genetic talent. You might do for running fast or swimming well, as in really well, but in order to be able to sleep and get the right amount of sleep, anyone can do that if they put their mind to it. Learning how to cook the basic foods, right? Anyone can do that. So major on the basics. Test yourself regularly. It doesn't have to be a, an all out lung searing FTP test. Math, math tests on the running are run at a math heart rate, so around 70%, but seeing if you can run for longer, uh, oh, sorry, cover the same distance in a shorter time or in the same time, cover a longer distance, whatever. Um, test yourself in the pool. You know, you can do a CSS test if you like, but maybe just see um, how long it takes you to swim 1.9K, swim breathing bilaterally. Uh, do maximize rest and recovery. Again, anyone can train. It takes a bit more to do the other stuff that I talked about at the beginning. And do focus on your weaknesses, but don't ignore your strengths. Right, let's come back to this one in a moment. Let's answer your questions. So I'm going to stop sharing for a sec. I'm going to come back to the questions that we had here. Uh, yeah, Laura, yes. I, I would reduce the time on the bike, certainly for your long rides. I would say if you had a three-hour ride planned, you could probably get away with around two to two and a quarter hours. So between 66 and 75 percent of time on the bike um, and to be honest for most people their sanity starts to wear a bit thin after they've been on the bike for um, more than two hours equally you could if you're doing turbo stuff and let's say it's it's a Sunday you don't go out with the club or your mate so you've got three hours of riding you could it's it's perfectly fine and you might and I'm getting all sciencey here, but in terms of building mitochondria, which is what we really want, to, what we're all trying to do to be better endurance athletes, but you get better cellular signaling by doing two sessions, six to eight hours apart. So doing two one to one and a half hour sessions on a Sunday might work equally. Um, 
Right, pros and cons for against turbo training and treadmill training. Yeah, Paul Thompson. So, again, same same thing about running on the treadmill in the winter. It's fine if you can put up with it all the time, but I think I'd be less concerned about your safety running outside in the winter than I would about running uh, about riding outside. Now, Simon Compton, been doing full half Olympic distance for many years. Now, fifty two years young, concerned with my heart rate when run training. Typically on a 10K run at 540 pace, heart rate average is 165, but drops quickly when finished. Is this okay? Uh, 165 sounds quite high. Um, 540 is a decent running pace um, for a training run. Um, is that what it's always been? So I'd have a few more questions. Uh, if it drops quickly, dropping quickly is good because it shows you, you're recovering well. Um, so that's fine. Is it okay? Well, uh, I would, it would depend on what your maximum heart rate is. Um, I would need to know that before I comment on the 165. Um, in terms of math pace, your math would be 180 minus 52, your normal math, which would give you a, a running pace of 128. Um, maybe you can, Simon, can you, can you type in quickly what your, um, what your maximum heart rate is, please. Uh, and while you're doing that, I will answer Carl Hussey's question. Is 10 hours training a week enough for a full? Yes, it is, Carl. Um, but I would ask you the question, how many hours a week can you commit to training? Because if you can only commit to training, then um, wishing you could have more isn't going to be any help. Um, you know, you've entered for a full and you've got 10 hours a week. It's enough to do a finish. But I go back to what I said at the beginning about being consistent. If you can do 10 hours a week between now and the end of July, so let's say you've got December, January, February, March, April, May, June, right? Seven months. Let's call that 30 weeks of training. If you do 10 hours a week, that's 300 hours a week of, or 300 hours of training that you've completed if you don't miss one. That's a lot of training, an awful lot. So... Please don't worry about whether it's enough. That's all you've got. So make the most of it. Get it done consistently and try and work out how you can be consistent. And we'll see you on the finish line. I've, I've seen people finish on much less, so please don't be worried about that. Uh, Ian Dixon, when timing, when timing high intensity intervals, should I include the time it takes to get from low intensity heart rate to my high intensity? No. Um, just take the time you're in your high intensity zone. So don't worry about when your heart rate gets there. It's about the whole session. So if you're doing 30 second bursts, you do um, on the bike and if it's 30 seconds at 300 watts. Measure the, measure the start of when you start putting out 300 watts and then keep going for 30 seconds and then go on to your recovery. Um, yeah, it takes me about a minute to move from a low intensity heart rate to a high intensity heart rate. Yeah, so on heart, on heart rate measurements on short duration intervals is, is much more difficult. So I will, uh, so I'd work on intensity there. Um, Steve Lewis, thanks for coming. Sorry, um, sorry, I had to go. Uh, Gary Patterson, swimming is a massive worry for me. When do people need to tend to start open water swimming? Um, right, Gary, so uh, can you tell me? Can you write in the chat box, please, Gary, what, what your biggest concern is with swimming? Is it actually being in open water or is it swimming in general? And while you're typing that, I will go back to Simon Compton. So, Simon, max, typical max heart rate on a 10K run is 180. So you're finishing at 165. So 180 minus 10% would be 162, which tells me that you're finishing your 10K run at around just over 90 percent now if that's a 10k p if that's a 10k race then that's what i'd expect if that's your average 10 kilometer run for training i would say that you're in a threshold zone uh, seems like you're just running too hard there so um again uh, i'd have to ask you for a bit more information simon so is that an average 10k run for you is that a 10k race um let's go back to gary patterson um Gary, um, Laura, can I, Laura says, okay, while I'm waiting for Gary and Simon to take, type their bits in, I'll go back to Laura. Laura Clark says, can you talk about the importance of brick sessions? Yes, Laura, brick sessions are important. Is that any good? <laughs> uh, yeah, 
it's important to learn how to run off the bike. Um, you don't need to do it every week. You could put it in once a week if you want. Uh, you definitely want to start doing more running off the bike. But don't forget, there's another brick session that most people don't do, and that is running, uh, that cycling after swimming. I think uh, that's equally as hard. Once you've been you've been horizontal in the water, you come out, you run to your bike, you're out of breath, um, your your hips are tight, and your hamstrings are tight because you've been wearing a wetsuit and you've been in a peculiar position and you've been kicking differently. Your shoulders are tight. You've got to get on the bike. You've got to get in that area position so you're all cramped up and you really want to stretch out. Uh, it takes about takes me about 15 to 20 minutes. So I think that's worth adapting to as well. Um, I won't worry too much about brick sessions right now. Um, you could do an occasional session if you're in the gym, you know, or it, on your turbo train. You could do 30 minute bike, 10 minute run, and you could do that two or three times. You could do an hour and a half on the bike and go out for a quick 10 minute run if you like. Um, it's just about getting used to the um, the feeling of running off the bike, but equally it's important to get used to swimming after the um, the running. Sorry, it's important to get used to biking after swimming. Right. Uh, yeah, Gary Pattinson, two main worries. Firstly, I have an irrational fear of open water. Okay, so let's cover that, Gary. Um, if it's that bad, uh, it might be worth seeking help from a psychologist to see if, you, if there's some other stuff that you can do. And generally, I find that once you concentrate on breathing and swimming, you can only focus on that and you stop focusing on the other things. Um, okay, right. So you're worried about getting up to the 1.2 meter distance in time. You're doing the outlaw half at the end of May. So you've, if, you've effectively, you've got, let's say the pool's open. You've got December, January, February, March, April, May. Jan, December, January, February, March, April. So you've got five months. That's even if the pool's closed until Christmas, you've got four months. Um, I think what you're going to have to do is just get up to swimming the 1.2 miles um, in the pool and know that you can swim it in the pool. It is different swimming in the open water, but you shouldn't be any slower. Um, the things that happen in open water are not sighting. So, yes, you do need to do that. But if the open water's too cold, um, that's going to be difficult. So you have to practice those pool uh, those open water skills in the pool during the winter um feel free to uh, if you email beth at the triathloncoach.com she'll put her email address in the um panel below please beth um if you email beth we can give you a bit more guidance on this outside the podcast uh tracy wilkinson says i'm a regular blood donor would you recommend i avoid this in the months of the outlaw well, that's a great question tracy and somebody did coincidentally somebody asked me about blood um being a blood donor recently and if so let's say you weigh 60 kilos a 60 kilo female will probably have about four and a half to five liters of blood you give a pint of blood when you go to give a donation so um that's about three quarters of a liter i think okay so you're probably losing slightly more than 10 percent of your blood volume including red blood cells and therefore oxygen carrying um, capacity. So that will affect, that may affect your um, ability to exercise. It may not. I don't know. I've not, I don't know about any studies on that. Um, but perhaps in the months up to the outlaw, uh, it might be worth avoiding that maybe from say April, March, April, right up to the outlaw, just so it doesn't compromise your training. Okay, right, Gary, uh, you've got Beth's address there. I think I've answered all the questions. Simon Compton, if you're still online, I don't think I've managed to uh, answer yours fully, but Beth's put her email address there. Or you can email me, simon at the triathloncoach.com, and I will, I'll um, work through that answer with you there. Um, one final thing for you guys before you go. For those of you who don't already have a plan as an official outdoor coach, um, we have plans for every single outlaw event. So we have race specific plans, which are 20 weeks long. Um, so the first of those, the, the outlaw half will probably start at the beginning of February, but we also have winter base plans, which are designed to get you from where you are now through to the start of that race specific plan in good shape. All right. I, I started writing these because I realized people were purchasing race plans and they hadn't done the training. So winter base plans and race specific plans. Now, currently, 
currently, in order to purchase one of these plans, um, you need to log back into your active account, which you set up in order to enter the race, go into my event, and you will be able to go to purchase items, and then you'll be able to um, purchase a winter base plan, and you'll be able to purchase uh, a race-specific plan for the event of your choice. You can get both now. We'll apply the winter base plan first, and then we'll apply your race plan nearer to the time. So we won't apply that just yet. For those of you who just want a race plan, you won't get anything until maybe seven to 10 days before it's due to start. Um, if you're finding difficulty with using Active, then uh, ring 01522-63953, and um, the people in the Outlaw office will do the best to help you um, with your purchase. Uh, one final thing about those training plans, they're all, they're all in uh, Training Peaks, so you'll need to set up a free account there and then we'll load the plan up for you. Beth will do all of the onboarding, we'll be able to answer all of your questions and we'll be right there holding your hand right up to race day. Okay, everybody, so that's it from me. Thank you very much for attending tonight. I hope I haven't kept you too late. It's half past eight now, so still time to get into your sleep routine and get to bed early and ready for tomorrow's training and um yep yeah simon yeah do simon come to do follow up um thank you for everybody that asked questions i will be sending out tomorrow or uh friday i'll send out details of where you can find the recording to listen again and um, you'll be able to respond to me at that point if you've got any further questions send them to me or beth and in that email i will give you a link to where you can get swim cords and to look at the uh, swim drills video that I created um, at the beginning of the first lockdown and then look out for details about the next webinar which will be coming up in January to talk about race specific training okay all right guys enjoy the rest of your evening and thanks again for attending I'll see you soon bye